some years ago, I was sitting next to a, a man at dinner. It was a dinner put on by my agent, my literary agent, who, who's from New York, and, and he gets a bunch of interesting people around a dinner table in a restaurant in London. And I started talking to this man, and he said, I'm Brian Eno, the musician. And I said, I know who you are. And I said, I'm an evolutionary biologist. And we began talking, as you do, about music and evolution. And I asked him, because he's a smart guy, as everybody knows, has anybody attempted to reconstruct the history of music, rather like linguists have attempted to reconstruct the history of languages? After all, Everybody in the world speaks a language, and linguists make evolutionary trees out of those languages. Everybody in the world, more or less, every culture sings songs. Surely, you could be able to reconstruct the history of music too. And he said, well, yeah. There has been one attempt, and it was by a guy called Alan Lomax. Lomax, funny guy, he was a collector of folk songs down in the American South. Many, many of the blues, famous blues songs, it was Lomax who collected them. But he was more than that. He, he was an ethnomusicologist with a very peculiar idea that you could quantify music and that you could show the relationships between music around the world. And in the 1960s, he got an awful lot of money and he set up the system for measuring music, which he and he got undergraduates to listen to the songs and then they would record their qualities, whether, they, whether the singers sang mm, with nasally or Wah, with an open voice, you know, or melismatically or with glissando or all these other qualities that you could listen for in the music. And he's quantified all this and he put it into some primitive statistical machinery and he made a big sort of chart and, and kind of an evolutionary tree of the music. And I said, that's mad, but it's brilliant. And what happened to it? He said, well, it sort of disappeared. Everybody hated it. All his fellow ethnomusicologists, they hated it. It was all about numbers. They don't do that. And I said, well, I'm going to find out more about this. And I did. And I went to New York where, and I got the data and I began working on this. And it was wonderful. But I quickly realized that really there has to be a better way than this data in which you've got from undergraduates listening to music, right? We're in the 2000s now, the early 2000s. Computers can do this. And indeed, there's a whole technology which is called musical information retrieval. It's the technology that allows you to measure the properties of songs, what kind of chords they have, what sort of, um, what sort of timbres they have, and their rhythms, and so on, and do it automatically. There's a whole engineering discipline devoted to this. Anyway, I made friends with some of those engineers, and got to learn how to use their tools. And then we decided, well, what are we going to study? Well, the thing about these tools is that they're mostly useful for studying pop music. They're, they're built for Western music rather than, say, the Inuit, which really just sound, well, they're just basically some men groaning to themselves while sitting on an ice floe. So we began to study pop. And not just any pop, we decided to study the Billboard Hot 100, 1960 to 2010, 17,000 songs. We downloaded them, we turned them into numbers. And we began to tell the history of pop through numbers. So it is that I claim, I think, immodestly perhaps, that I know more about pop music than anyone, despite actually not even liking it that much. Mm. And the reason is simple, is because we all have opinions about pop and its evolution and what happened when and what was, what was important and the relationships between musicians. But all of that stuff, we just make it up, right? I mean, we have, there's no reason to think that any of it is true. When, is the, when was the greatest changes in pop music, right? When was it all happening? The answer is, well, usually when you were 17, right? I mean, and that's because we're just naturally embedded in, in pop because it's part of the stories of our lives. So our point is to take it away from us and turn it into a science.
So we had the numbers. We began by asking, when did the great revolutions happen? We developed an algorithm for estimating revolutions, a revolution detector, we called it. And the answer is that in American popular music, there were three of them. 1964, give or take a few years, 1981, 1991. What were they? 1964, this is, its music becomes rock and roll, basically. The British arrive, the Beatles arrive in America, that's part of it too. 1981, that's the rise of the drum machine and the synthesizer. It just flattens the musical landscape completely. And it's important. I mean, everything from country music, you know, through to techno just sounds, it sounds all basically the same, like a Miami Vice soundtrack. But the big one, the most striking thing is that, and, and we didn't expect this, but maybe we should have in retrospect, is that the single most important phenomenon in the history of American popular music was the rise of hip hop. And it is just bigger than anything else that happens before or since. And it's more radical too, because of course the thing about hip hop is that it breaks the laws of music. One of the things our machines do is detect chords, but when it tries it on hip hop, lots of the time it can't. Why? Because hip hop to a considerable degree is about rapping, it's about spoken word. So the algorithm attempts to find a chord and it can't. It's just a complete transformation of the musical landscape. And that, along with many other things, are the sorts of things that we've done in order to tell the history of American pop through numbers. So one of the first questions we wanted to know, I mean, I suppose it's an obvious one about the history of American music is, when did it change? So there are two views about how culture or how organisms change in, in the fossil record. You know, one is that it all happens rather gradually. The other is that it happens by revolutions. Well, we wanted to answer this question objectively. Are there revolutions? And if so, when did they happen? So we developed an algorithm called a revolution detector. It's a little bit complicated, but the essence isn't that hard. Essentially, you measure the average distance. Hmm. You measure the properties of a song in this year. You measure the properties of the song in this year. And you can calculate the distance, how far they are apart from each other. And you do it for this year, this year, this year, this year, this year, and two years, and sort of running average along, right? And then you can get an, an estimate of the difference. And if you find there's a big difference, our algorithm picks it up and tells you, you've got a revolution, yeah? So, we sought revolutions and we found them, and there were three of them, 1964, 1981, 1992. 1964, and bear in mind this is America we're talking about here, so that's essentially the rise of rock and roll. The British invasion contributes to it, contributes to it. It turns out that the Beatles and the Who and the Stones, they did not make the revolution, American Revolution 1984, the British invasion, but they certainly contributed to it. 1981 is the spread of the drum machine and synthesizers, which just obliterate and flatten the musical landscape completely from country through to dance. And then, of course, there's the big one, which is the 1990s. And that, and it surprised us, but we should have guessed in retrospect, because this is America, it's the rise of hip hop, and it's the biggest single revolution in the history of American music. And the reason it's so big is because it runs so deep, because it's so important numerically, and also because the music is so fundamentally different from anything that's come before. Now, you may be surprised at the late date. I mean, of course, bear in mind that hip hop begins early, but it only really becomes a revolution and changes things substantially in the charts. In the 90s, it takes at least 10 years for it to get that way out of the South Bronx. And it's the most important single cultural event in the history of pop, 20th century American pop music. But of course, given these numbers, we can do so much more. And one of the things we can do is we can ask, what are the forces shaping popular music? So, 
you can imagine that we've got these we've got these time series data. We've measured these properties of the songs. Let's say um, the frequency of thrashing guitars, you know, da -na 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 -na, like that, right? And, and so we can measure it over time. And you can see it increase in the 60s, decrease, increase, decrease, increase. And what you're looking at is the rise, the fall, the rise, the fall, and the rise of rock and roll. Or you can look at, you can measure the frequency of songs in which a girl sings, ooh, ooh, ooh. you know, a female voice singing in a melodic, gentle, ooh, ooh fashion. I can't describe it any better, but you know what I'm talking about. Well, it turns out that that's actually pretty stable too over time. And here's one of the surprising things we discovered is that although the songs are changing, the music actually stays the same. It's just music, pop music is amazingly conservative. And you can use various mathematical tests, various statistical tests to ask whether the music is changing as a random walk or whether it's at some sort of equilibrium. And you can show that pop is never a random walk. It's never, it seems to be just changing in arbitrary directions, but it's not. It's actually amazingly constant. It's as if there are some forces which are shaping it all the time. And I think that's true. There are. Think of the example that I gave. Songs about by young women artists, right? You know, uh, um, who who sing, uh, you know, you know, in a sort of ooh, ooh, ooh kind of way. Well, those are songs by young women about love and loss and boys who've done them wrong, and and they've always been there. And as long as boys do bad things to girls and leave them heartbroken. There will always be a market for those songs. There is, as it were, a niche. And it is that which, it is that need, that role in the marketplace, which just keeps the music constant for so, for so long. And the same is true of rock and roll. One of the things that's so striking, as I said, you know, you can see rock and roll come, you can see it go again, you can see it come back again. And again, it's, there's an equilibrium which means, although I cannot say that rock and, ro rock and roll will never die, I can say that it's very, very hard to kill.